It is Friday, June 5th. It's a bit after 8 p.m. and I'm Tsuda, Daisuke Tsuda, a journalist. And with the cooperation of the Goethe Institute, we are bringing you our show, hashtag Studio 202X. In April, we had a four-part series and this will be season two of the hashtag Studio 202X. We will have four uh, parts um, in June, and in the first part, uh, excuse me, in the first season, we have focused on the coronavirus, and in season two, we will also pick up the coronavirus issue as well as democracy. So the theme for season two is the future of democracy. And the theme for part one today is physical integrity versus rights of individual freedom. Because of the coronavirus, uh, we have experienced lockdown and many private rights have been restricted by the government. And in order to contain uh, the spread of the virus, sometimes uh, tracking devices, tracking technology has been used in some cases. But because of that, our privacy rights have been violated in some cases. So how do we balance uh, between the two? Um, that is something that we need to discuss as we go forward. And today we have three guests. I'd like to introduce the three. Uh, first of all, uh, Attorney at Law and General Secretary of Human Rights Now, it's Mitz Kazuko Ito. Thank you very much and philosopher and professor at the university, Dr. Toshihito Kayano. Thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Kayano, and thank you for inviting me. And far away in Germany, we have jurist and professor of Humboldt University, Berlin, Professor Christoph Müller. Hello. <laughs> and we will be speaking to all three guests. But first, to start off, um, when we think about fiscal integrity versus rights of individual freedom, um, I'd like to go around with a self-introduction. I'd like to ask all speakers to tell us what you were thinking in the past three, four months of the corona era. Um, I'd like to ask each one to use about five minutes to talk about the issues you've seen and living under, living with the coronavirus. So starting with uh, okay. Professor Kayano, please. Well, thank you very much. Um, my job, of course, is teaching at a university. And the university, because of the coronavirus, uh, we weren't able to hold regular classes. So we had to think about how to uh, switch to online classrooms and during that as of course at universities we also have meetings um, they were all online meetings and uh, because of that uh, going paperless which was difficult in the past it seems we have seen a progress here and also we have eliminated the unnecessary meetings um, I believe many people agreed. So I think we were able to streamline the way we work. Uh, I think many professors would understand, but the meetings of professors, of course, usually involves a lot of papers being issued. And of course, sometimes you have to ch uh, change and update uh, the papers, and then uh, you have to copy them, our staff, are busy working until the very end. Uh, sometimes you have to take copies um, until the very start of the meeting. And even in the national diet, that uh, probably is happening. But now with online meetings, everything is paperless. You just click and um, you change what you want to change online and that's it. You don't have to print it out. So there were a lot of wasteful work and many people rejected paperless uh, meetings. Um, but now uh, we were forced into that, and things progressed. 
And I think in, a, in many ways, uh, things were streamlined because of the coronavirus. Um, that's a positive side of COVID-19. And also, it seems that the society is moving towards a cashless society. And I think that's another positive effect. Now, the theme of, of the day, freedom or liberty, um, if you look at South Korea, um, they have a citizen's number or uh, each person is given a number. It's not just the bank account numbers, but um, the credit cards and cell phones are all linked to these personal numbers. And so if you use the GPS function on your cell phone and if somebody is infected with the virus, you can see where that person went to and therefore they use this tracking uh, technology uh, so that clusters will not f uh, be formed. So this is all about liberty versus monitoring and controlling. So we have to rethink the balance between the two. In the past, freedom and also control by the governance was were seen as something in conflict. But I'm not saying that uh, what South Korea did was right and very good, but if we use technologies like this in order to contain the infection, then we will be able to return the freedom of activities back to citizens very quickly. So in the past, these two things were seen as A versus B. But um, I believe because of uh, the coronavirus, uh, we had to go through a rethinking. And also the digital technologies that we all had are now starting to spread even further. Of course, today we'll be looking at um, freedom as well as control. And I'm hoping to have a very good discussion about the two. And I'm, once again, let me say that I'm not saying that I am for what South Korea has done, but I believe that this is going to change the whole landscape. And also on the term issue of economy, the, when we had the new influenza uh, spread, Initially, we tried to restrain people from moving about and many countries that were able to contain and control the people infected, uh, they were able to get back on their feet in terms of economy very uh, m much faster than other countries that were not able to contain the contagion. So freedom versus control, they are not in conflict. I believe uh, they, they could be balanced in a good way. I, that, that's something that I felt um, in the past three, four months. And there are many other things I'd like to talk about, but I think I'll end here for now. Thank you very much. Uh, one point that you've raised is um, the digital technology and freedom. Um, that's one aspect, and also control and freedom. And I believe that is part of our theme today. But these two, we tended to think that go up against each other, but it seems that it's, we can't t say that um, anymore. Maybe they are not uh, things that go up against each other. I think we can come back to that discussion later on. Well, then moving on to Ms. Ito, can you uh, go through a self-introduction and uh, give us your thoughts? Well, thank you very much. I'm a lawyer and also I work as General Secretary of Human Rights Now, a human rights organization. And from April this year, I have started to study international law. Um, I am aiming to get a PhD um, in Waseda University. I have started my research for my PhD. But then we had the state of emergency declaration. Um, and for but the past two months, no court hearings have been held. I have been staying at home. And yes, there were many online meetings, like uh, Professor Kayano said. I have been quite busy in the past, but I think this was the first time I was able to stand still for a while. I think it could be said not just for me, but for everyone in Japan. Uh, people probably were 
going face to face where it could be done online um, in Japan we have these stamp seals that have to be stamped um, and that has been eliminated and uh, we have been going global and um, sometimes there were exploitation um, and we had a lot of environmental destruction um, the capitalism there was no way to stop it so we were working without stopping but now this is giving us an opportunity to pause so I am now doing research Aristotle Socrates I'm starting to study from there regarding how should we live why do human beings live that's what I'm looking into and if you go to bookstores there are lots of people looking at similar books they're looking at books on philosophy I think now people are standing still and thinking and they're able to do that that's how I frankly feel and another thing is in relation to human rights there was an alert by the uh, UN Secretary General and there is a crisis moving forward the virus can be caught by anyone and the impact is impacting the people who are poor and about 1.8 billion people cannot wash their hands 2.2 billion people are unable to maintain social distancing because of the way they live and regarding health and sanitation some people many people are unable to have access so they tend to be affected seriously and these kinds of people they are affected seriously which means this is a global society which means no one is free from contagion there is discrepancy and we have to tackle these human rights problems but the virus comes from outside the country so you try to contain it this happened in Japan too there was a lot of people um, criticism of people who work in the medical field or people who have been infected so people say the virus comes from outside there have been lots of hate speeches and some people uh, in China in the US uh, they're trying to contain certain people suppress so I think there are some very dangerous elements here in the current situation. That's what I think. That's pretty much all from myself. Yes, thank you. So this has to do with human rights as well. And like Miss Ito said, there's the problem of discrimination, of course, that's coming to the surface. And there's the problem of uh, discrepancies or gaps and supermarkets and retail stores there are essential workers who work at these stores and they are being forced to, to work in high-risk environments and another thing that's been reported is with the COVID-19 all over the world people have to stay home which means that we're seeing more domestic violence or we're seeing abuse of children violence against children uh, that's happening all over the world with COVID-19 this is leading to uh, lots of human rights issues coming to the surface and uh, Ms. Ito you think that through COVID-19 in a variety of ways we're starting to put the limelight more on human rights and regarding this do you feel any change uh, yes so the people who are disadvantaged, uh, there's a big impact on them. And regarding this, in Japan too, there's domestic violence or uh, how do you uh, make sure that people who are hiding from abusive spouses, how that they get these uh, payments? So uh, this has been discussed a lot and a lot of people are starting to talk about this. And online, people are home so in the past be it politics be it social issues before people didn't have the time or the room or the leeway to show interest but now they have time to do so and online they're starting to discuss this we're starting to have an environment in japan now for having this interest of course there are hate speeches but on the other hand there are other positive aspects as well that's how i feel i see thank you next professor muller's uh, as Professor Kaino said, as Ito-san said, there are points of worry and then there are positive aspects as well. So Professor Mullers, could you please introduce yourself and then tell us what you've been thinking about these past few months? Yes, thank you very much for having me there. 
So as someone from Germany, I have definitely different experiences. But otherwise, as a professor of law, I have perhaps similar experiences. <laughs> For me, on a personal note, the, the university hasn't really improved. I see that we have less meetings, but I also see that teaching has become much more difficult. And that teaching is very much dependent on bodily presence. Students' memory somehow works with the body. And people keep things in mind with specific experiences that are tied to the rooms they're entering, people they're looking at, um, kinds of ways things are explained that get lost in digital communication. So, so my guess would be that people learn that much less on a digital transfer than they would learn when they are in a room. On a more general note, I'm still rethinking what I have to think about coronavirus and observing myself. I think it's interesting that my whole thinking changed all the time from March to April to May to June. At the beginning, everyone was quite anxious and unsure, and it looked a little bit dystopian always, also because no one really knew what would come and if there would any success of the measures that were taken by the government. But this exactly was always something quite uniting. So people were somewhere in this together and somewhere built a community and the consensus was very high. Today we see that so far everything has been worked out quite successfully in Germany. And we see that all the measures are somehow scaled back. But the consensus is a way too. So basically now people start to fight about the usefulness of the measures. Um, they fight about, you know, was it worth to um, restrict so many freedoms? Who has to pay the price? And so on and so forth. With respect to human, with regard to human rights, I think it's interesting to see that we did not have any state of emergency formally, but we had courts that somehow were working with balancing tests and were at the beginning of the crisis quite hesitant to review any state measures and became over the weeks more and more bold and reviewed more and more. So that today we have fine, in a way, kind of standard judicial review of many measures that are taken against, let's say, religious services or demonstrations, public appearances, and so on. And the whole balance of powers is somehow reinstated to a certain degree. Still, one doesn't really know what will happen. And, 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 and And we can observe that the standards of review and the standards of, you know, parliamentary inclusion into the whole political process are lower at the moment than they had been before. So the whole process is a little bit more administrative and executive than parliamentary and political. And this is a problem. With regard to the question of, you know, social distribution of the harm that is um, produced by the um, crisis and its measures against, the measures against the crisis, it's important to see, I think, that this idea of pausing and reflection, um, which is a nice one, is probably very much a bourgeois idea of people um, who don't work or who don't have kids, actually. Because what we also see is that the distribution of effort with people who are in their homes with children was so that basically many, many people couldn't really work. 
and were very much under stress. So many elements of social inequality have just been reinforced and become more dramatic through the crisis. And it's not entirely clear if that will really be compensated for at the, in the end. So for researchers, all this is very interesting because you see that the crisis often somehow reinforces social structures that are already there and makes them uh, crystallize them out and makes them more transparent. So it may be a critical moment for many, but it's an interesting moment to, to observe societies. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'd like to have one question for Professor Mellers. Uh, under COVID-19, in the past three, four months, you said that your thinking has changed almost every month. It changed along the way throughout the months. So did it change from positive to negative thinking, or did it change from negative to positive thinking? Uh, what changed, or how, how did it change specifically? Well, you know, I, I think I have no read general answer to that. It is not that it changed either from positive to negative, nor vice versa. Rather, it changed from a little bit, from a mixture of anxiety and somehow curiosity to a little bit form of, you know, business-like boredom sometimes and a little more critical analytical approach to what is actually going on. So in the beginning, we were part of a community of anxious citizens and now we are back to being somehow political um, subjects that somehow um, debate what is going on and are probably don't have so much consensus as they had before. Thank you very much for that. Well then, let's move on into our discussion. Uh, starting with Dr. Kayano, Professor Kayano, we have just heard uh, Professor Mellers speak, and I think the way countries dealt with COVID-19 was different um, depending on the social structure or whether or not they had a state of emergency declaration and also the trust people have towards the government. Um, of course, these are different from country to country, and also that may have affected the spread of the virus as well. But looking at the difference of countries and also what happened in Germany versus Japan, what, what is your view? Well, thank you. Um, first of all, about Japan then. It seems we learned that the government was quite very weak. Um, Many people have been criticizing the government, um, and for those people, uh, they have thought that uh, the government uses their author authority, um, they abuse it. But why is it that Japan was unable to give out orders that will mandate people to refrain from doing things? That is probably shown in the way the government handled this situation. Um, and we do have, or rather, many countries have numbers, um, for example, social security numbers for citizens. But here in Japan, um, although we have numbers, it didn't work very well. Maybe if we had a numbering system, we were able to provide benefit payments much earlier. Uh, that could have been good. And if we have these personal identity numbers, and if it was working and functioning, uh, maybe people who have fled uh, from a domestic violence situation, um, even the spouses that have fled um, a, a violent partner would have been able to receive the payment. Uh, but it seems uh, here in Japan, the tax 
uh, is being paid by households, but uh, therefore the government has no grasp on each individual person. Therefore, there is no way to be able to pay uh, to the spouses that have fled um, their violent partners. So it's, it just showed that the government was unable to do all these things up until now. And why is it? I think we need to think about that. And I'm not trying to say that political power is good or anything, but the power of the Japanese government, um, for example, versus the United States, France, um, Germany, um, European countries, or South Korea, Taiwan, uh, maybe we can include China, but compared to these countries, Japan was unable to be forceful, even if being forceful was better, because we didn't have a structure in place to do that. So I think there is uh, this is a reflection of the relationship between the government and its people. So many people have been criticizing the government of being abusive of authority, but I think it made them rethink uh, the situation of the government. One other thing. So using power for control versus freedom, uh, this is in relation to that theme, but we have been criticizing the government for a very long time, uh, and we have been against uh, streamlining too much the administrative work, but what happened in the end? The city halls or the public health centers or even the staff working at the diet or in ad administrative um, offices, uh, these staff people were overworking themselves in order to make the system in Japan work, uh, take the benefit payments um, in Japan, uh, for example. Uh, paperwork was necessary to explain about how to get the benefit payments and the city offices were working hard to send these notices out. And we have been criticizing the government in the past, but we didn't know who, who were working behind the government, um, people who were against the identity numbers. Um, they didn't really understand what they were objecting. Well, thank you very much, uh, Prof uh, Professor Kayano. I thought about the children who are waiting to get into nursery schools or um, to child care centers in order to get into the nurseries. Um, the quotas were calculated using a lot of different formulas. Um, and maybe allocating uh, and trying to see which child goes to which nursery. And many 30 or so staff worked for about one month in order to see which child could go where. And then I think Fujitsu, a Japanese company, uh, created an artificial intelligence system to calculate that, which worked it out in a second or so. And this is a part of how you can really streamline administrative work. Now, Ms. Ito, you have heard Professor Kayano speak, but um, for the benefit payment, um, maybe we can streamline this, and, but, but having a lot of, giving a lot of power to the administration may lead to anxiety on the part of people uh, that this might um, infringe upon human rights or freedom. What is your view, Ms. Ito? Well, thank you very much. I believe you are throwing me a very difficult question. But uh, the, the, there are two sides um, 
when we think about um, human rights and the national government. Um, you, the government is not supposed to infringe upon human rights or privacy rights, and the n national government is not supposed to abuse its power. And the government is supposed to distribute f fairly um, the taxes that it co collected. Um, and sometimes in forms of benefit payments. In the case of Japan, this time the problem was compared to other countries, for example, in Germany, there's a big difference between Japan and Germany. The decision to make the benefit payments, Japan was so late in making that decision. And first, the people, they were having a really difficult time, and the decision to compensate them, that decision came really, really late. And I think that we should summarize about that. And in the international comparison, Japan does very poorly. And recently, at last, the payments are being made, but Japan is still really, really late. And other than that, regarding streamlining administration, how far can our privacy be entrusted to the government? It depends on how the country was established and founded. And do people have distrust of authority? In Japan, people have a strong distrust of authority. So this relationship between the people and the government, there's an unfortunate history. And the people are not really willing to give their privacy or trust the government with their privacy. But how about South Korea then? In South Korea, people often say, as we just heard, South Korea does, uh, the people do trust their privacy to the government. And people say, in South Korea, the democracy is so far forward, it's so advanced, it's okay. But I think that's a very risky discussion. So people want benefits, payments. People want to be protected by the government, especially in a crisis like this. People are anxious, so they want to be protected. They want the government to do something for them. And as a trade-off, people's privacy. How far should we give up on our privacy? We should be very, very cautious about this. Plus, in countries like South Korea, you don't know when the government will change. You don't know when everything is going to change. So I think that this is more like an exception. And maybe South Korea will become like a surveillance state. There is that risk. We need to constantly think about that and move forward with our discussions. And what's important here is the transparency of the government or its responsibility to make explanations. That's what I feel. I see, thank you. And Professor Muller, regarding what Ms. Ito said, I'd like to ask you what you thought about what she said as well. But the government does not interfere with the individual freedom or the government should not uh, in interfere with privacy. But if you want to streamline administration, then there may be infringements. But having said so, with using digital technologies for streamlining, does that infringe on people's human rights? Somewhere, regarding the way we do it. If you go this far, then it's okay for the government to do so. You have to draw that line in a way that satisfies the people. So drawing that line is important, I think and drawing it where the people feel it's okay. So we need to hold discussions as we draw that line. And I think that is the democratic process. And regarding this, what do you think? Or in Germany, in Germany, regarding this, regarding discussions of drawing the line of how far the government can go, how did you create consensus and agreement? Could you let us know about your process in Germany? Well, first of all, I find it's very interesting how self-critical the Japanese are with the Japanese system. While in Germany, Japan is still considered to be a role model, at least for the fight against the infection itself. Perhaps not for the um, aftermath and the fight against social um, consequences, um, but the very fact that the um, infection was somehow contained in that, um, in that manner 
something that is very well observed in Germany as a successful story. Now, it's interesting to wonder if we are really much more effective with regard to the distribution of welfare and entitlements for people who are somehow um, damaged by the, um, by the virus. Maybe we are, but it's hard to tell because we have a very decentralized system. And um, the very support that arrives with someone, money or some other kind of um, a welfare um, um, benefit is normally administered by, by the municipalities uh, in a system that is also very federal. And I would guess that these experiences of different citizens with that systems are vastly different depending on which part of this uh, country they live. A fact that somehow fragments the experience and fragments the political process against it. So that there is no real general critique um, of the way benefits are distributed in Germany. Um, but maybe there are problems too, or maybe we don't really know that. Um, there's a certain un um, uncertainty about all these questions on, on a practical level. With regard to the um, question of tra tracing and, and, and personal um, inf rights to information, um, I think it's interesting that we had a very short but very effective debate on that with regard to the kind of tracing app we are now trying to get. And I must say, we don't have one so far. So government tells us we will get some one in mid-June, probably mid-June or end of June. And the government wanted to have a centralized system in which all the data are somehow pooled at one place. And this was impossible for the public. So basically, the government didn't get it. And it was, was interesting to see how, how quickly that worked. So basically, there was a debate. There was an association of research institutions that were, in a way, developing the app. Um, this, the research institutions themselves were in dissensus. They somehow split apart. Um, and at the end, we came to a system that is decentralized, more or less. so that we get a system in which people who are informed about an infection close to them, um, but um, where no really central information of all the infected or possibly infected will be um, stored with the government. So we'll see if that works. All in all, I think one reason why the trust in, to the government is relatively high with regard to that is that we have a very strong constitutional review. So we have a constitutional court that regularly strikes down governmental or parliamentary decisions um, in the realm of information rights, security, supervision, and police rights, and so on and so forth. So in the last year, we have had a real string of big decisions with regard to the federal police, federal intelligence services, um, data pooling, data retention that struck down a lot of legislation. So even if the democratic process somehow fails to draw a line, um, we get a quite robust constitutional review that somehow reinforces the trust of the public um, into the status that then somehow are left and are then constitutional. I wanted to ask you, Professor Mellis, Chancellor Merkel, Angela Merkel, her leadership regarding this corona issue has been very highly uh, regarded. And many people, I believe, are satisfied with what she has done, and her popularity is rising. And before the uh, COVID situation, I believe her support rate was down, and she was facing a very tough situation. But the way she responded to COVID-19, the leadership that she exerted, I think, how would you think of her leadership? Well, I think, you know, the strength of Angela Merkel is more in the realm of rational administration than of governmental politics. And the COVID crisis is in a way an administrative problem 
you know you know what you know what the aim is you don't debate a aims you do only to talk about means and therefore i think the german government system all in all was quite successful because it's very cooperative and obviously Merkel is very intelligent and has a, has a good sense for scientific um um knowledge and she's somehow very well able to get an own assessment of the situation um and that is her strong strength much more than political you know creation and and political decision making and one has also to add that the german in germany the citizens were always confronted with the, the chancellor and the kind of um, group of the prime ministers of the states and all the political decisions were ma basically made in this kind of consensus structure where the citizens somehow were always looking at both the head of the government the federal government and the head of the state the prime minister of the federal um, substate and this led to some kind of i think more trust because the system was always present in different figures coming from different parties and there was a consensus in this plurality um that somehow was quite trustworthy and took uh, basically even people into a consensus that didn't vote for Angela Merkel when well, most people didn't vote for her so and this worked very well and i think this kind of federalism administrative federalism worked very well well then thank you um professor kayano I think there were a lot of interesting points that Professor Mellers have raised. Um, so uh, he said that Japan was a role model in containing the infection. Many uh, national, rep rep uh, national leaders um, have shown, seen their approval rating go up, but here in Japan it's gone down, despite the fact that um, we have been handled the uh, infection uh, very well. Um, of course, Japan is not a republic um, or federation, uh, a federal republic. Um, I believe that is the difference, but um, in any case, uh, many people have been criticizing what the government has done. So when you look at Japan and Germany and this stark comparison between the two, what, what is your opinion? Well, this is something I would like to say to Professor Mellers as well, but in Germany, the Japanese people who are working in Germany Um, they had to refrain from certain activities um, because of COVID-19 and they asked for benefit payment and then two days later or maybe three days later um, they got the benefits in their bank account and that hit the news here in Japan and this was a great surprise to all Japanese citizens because in Japan um, we are supposed to be able to get a blanket cash payment of 100,000 yen. At the end of April, um, the budget was formed in order to pay out that much for each individual. But finally, I have just received the application form. And it's probably going to take m many more days until I actually get that money. So the decision came late. Yes, it was late, but it's not just the decision being late, but the action taken by the administration after that decision is taking a very long time. So freedom and administrative control. Many people were against administrative control, but have we spread our freedom because of that? Maybe not. Uh, when, first of all, I'd like to say that now we are having that discussion here. So when, that, when people heard the news about the payment in Germany, um, we envied you. We envied Germany. Now, um, switching to another subject. We did not have any restrictions against going out from home that accompanied punishment, but so far people followed these instructions and we were able to contain the 
the infection to a certain point. Um, yes, many criticize the government and the government's approval rating, the cabinet approval rating has gone down. And this may seem quite strange. It may be a mystery. Bec uh, there is no trust against the government, but people followed the government's instructions, even if it didn't accompany punishment. The government said, stay home, and people did that. So we are obedient, but we are still complaining. So what is this? Uh, many analysis being made by other countries about Japan and Japanese people analyzing Japan would say that people in Japan are obedient to power, but maybe not. I think maybe not. It's if we were really obedient, we won't criticize the government under this crisis. But we are freely criticizing the government. So maybe we need a more detailed analysis of this situation. And one thing I feel is at its root, there are two things, but one is that more than the government, people are really afraid of how the society looks at them. If we are asked to refrain from going out and everybody is staying at home, if you do something against that trend, uh, you will be criticized by the society. Maybe the government will not punish you, but people around you will criticize you. So people follow the rules and stay at home. So that's one. And we often hear about this. Uh, pe we often follow the flow or follow the mood or trend that you see around. But there's another thing. Obedience and protection. There is this uh, trading, trade between these two. So we will follow what you say, but we will criticize you. If you are not going to protect us, we are going to kick you out. So yes, we will follow what you say, but I will criticize you. But if your measures are not going to going to go well, uh, then we will kick you out. The cabinet will lose their job. Uh, Karl Schmidt, um, a German uh, jurist, um, I probably uh, will. In any, any case. Obedience and protection, Karl Schmidt said, that in any country is at the very core of power. I think he pointed that out in many of his writings. So obedience and protection. So as long as you follow me, I will protect you. And if you don't protect me, I am going to raise questions. I believe this trade-off is working very well here in Japan. So I'm wondering how other people look at Japan. Well, thank you very much. I think that's a very interesting point. Uh, so there were these obedience police of sorts in Japan, um, pe people watching to see if people were really following the instructions by the government. So there may have been nothing written as law, but many businesses closed down, many restaurants were closed. Um, during the emergency situation. But some people said that I have the freedom to stay open, and they stayed open. And sometimes people criticize these shops. Um, sometimes they were looted. And that happened here in Japan. So, if, so surveillance technology. Uh, surveillance technology, uh, it's not well developed like South Korea. It's not really installed out there in society. But 
we are uh, people are watching other people. So we are watching each other in a sense. And we are focusing on the good of the community. And if somebody goes against the good of the community, then that person will be um, kicked out of society, ostracized. So yes, we will obey what the government says, but we will also criticize you. In other words, probably Japanese people don't really trust the government. We are not really expecting much from the government. And that is why the voting rate when we have elections is very low here in Japan. Now, Ms. Ito, yes, um, human rights, how people see human rights may differ from country to country, but what is your view on what uh, Professor Kayano just said? Well, yes, I agreed m much to what he said. Yes, uh, people want to follow others in Japan. Um, and individuality compared to Europe um, probably is not widespread here in Japan. That has been the case for many, many years. Um, the community, um, how the community sees you is very important to many citizens. So that they get very soft pressure from the community and probably that is um, controlling the way we act. And what you were talking about, about obedience and protection, the trade-off. This time, I think maybe there's a big difference this time. In the past, I think people, um, famous people who did not criticize the government in the past or organizations that did not criticize the government are starting to criticize before they were unable to do so, but now they are criticizing the government. And I was quite surprised several times. And before the government was saying it wouldn't even give out 100,000 yen. But lots of people said that's not good enough, the government has to do something. So there was the 100,000 yen problem. And then there was the problem of the head of the police. Uh, there are these problems. And the background to this is, this time, the benefits are not enough. Especially for people who run their own businesses, the compensation is not sufficient. And then in an ambiguous way, people are requested to stay closed. And there's no compensation. And people are feeling frustration. And we too. Regarding the protection part, we are being protected and the authority has the right to distribute the resources that we have. So people who were not speaking up before, they were feeling that before they didn't have to speak up, they thought that they were being protected. But now that their rights are being violated, they are now feeling they have to speak up. I think that's what's been happening. So regarding the severe criticism of the government, that's what I believe is happening. So what was true before is no longer true. I think that's a key word. Uh, so kayano -san, regarding what Ms. Ito just said, so there was the uh, problem of revising the law regarding the uh, chief prosecutor. So because of the COVID-19 problem, people are starting to criticize. People can't go to work and they've been watching what the government is doing. They're showing more interest and they have more time to pay attention. And as a result, people are speaking up and criticizing the government. And what caught my attention is COVID-19 in this special situation, is this a one-off thing? Or like Ms. Ito says, is this the start of change? Uh, Professor Kayano, what do you think about these changes in the awareness of politics? I think that what Ms. Ito said at the end Personally, I think she was actually um, strengthening what I was saying because in the past, people who are not speaking up are speaking up because they thought they were being protected, but they're not being protected. That's why they're speaking up. At the foundations of this is, because the government is protecting me, I will obey. There was that trade-off before. That's why. Therefore, in Japan, at a glance, it looks like there's no trust in the government. That's why in the past we could not streamline the administration. That's one aspect. But on the other hand, is it really true? If people are protected, will they obey? 
or before they were obedient because they're being protected. That's not true. That's why they're criticizing. But if you dig down deeper, deep down, actually, maybe people are over reliant on the government, but they want to criticize. So this is like an adolescent, a youngster who relies on his patients, but he wants to rebel as well. Maybe that's that kind of characteristic as well. I feel maybe that's true a little bit. I see. So, Professor Mellis, listening to your two other members, what did you think? Well, it's interesting because on the one hand, I think that the Japanese and the German systems are quite similar in that people don't have too many programmatic political expectation to the government. What they want is a functioning administration. So they want to get the service. They don't want to get any political utopia or some program that is really in a deeper sense political realized. And um, so I think Japan and Germany are both very much uh, um, bureaucratic systems that are centered around this idea of functioning much more than let's say the United States or other political systems, other more emphatic democracies. But on the other hand, we see that this similarity now plays out in different directions because people in Germany see, feel themselves well served by the government. And I don't even know if this is, you know, for a good reason, you know, that is basically a construction that is very dependent on how the media presents the whole thing, very different experiences. So there is no necessarily a truth in that construction in both cases. But as the bottom, the bottom line is, in Germany, people are somehow satisfied with the government. And you can see that the right wing um, critique, crit critics of the system we have, so basically the right authoritarian parties we have, are now dramatically losing support um, because no one trusts them um, to get any concrete problem well solved. And no one trusts them to somehow run an administration in a way that helps for in, in a concrete problem. So the legitimacy of the whole system has really um, been um, enlarged by the crisis so far. And, um, and even if everyone is a little bit bored and annoyed by the grand coalition, but so many years of Merkel and so forth and so forth, um, everyone is also reminded that somehow they are living in a more or less well-organized republic and, and get something they need. And therefore, the stability is higher than before so far. Professor Kayano, regarding what Professor Meller said, I think what you, what you heard was interesting. Personally, what I found interesting was Rather than a political utopia, people are looking for a functioning administration. That's what the people want. And in Germany, it's functioning. But in Japan, it's not functioning. That's why that's, it's being reflected in the approval ratings. I think that's related to what you were saying, Professor Kayano. Going forward, what's going to happen in the future? That's another thing of concern. COVID-19 is not over. And new infections, when you think about other infections, there could be a second wave, a third wave of COVID-19, or there could be a sudden mutation, there could be a new infection. When that happens, then we're going to face the same kind of problem. So regarding a risk control or crisis control in the future, regarding physical integrity and rights of individual freedom, which is has priority. How do we maintain a balance? If we are to maintain a balance, then what kind of discussion do we need to have? Through COVID-19, I think the prerequisites of the discussion. So this much, we talked about the uh, personal IDs, but it's more convenient if we have that. Or regarding this, this needs to uh, hide the names of people and uh, um, we need to maintain privacy. In coming up with a system, I think that thanks to COVID-19, we've managed to come to the starting line. There have been some changes. But what do you think regarding the future? Uh, yes. Regarding the problem that you have just proposed, I think it's a very important proposition. And I want to answer you very quickly, but just one point. Regarding what Professor Mellis was saying, I would like to once again ask Professor Mellis a question. Is that all right? 
So earlier on, Professor Mellis, you were saying that there are similar points and different points between Japan and Germany. And in a time of emergency, what I recall is, after World War II, in, among the industrial nations, there were students' protest movements in the 1960s. The students had a very um, violent movement. And globally, the countries that became very violent were Japan and Germany, when the students became very violent. In Japan, for example, there was the Japan uh, Red Cross, a uh, Red Army, sorry. Organizations like that engaged in global terrorism. But in Germany, there was the German Red Army. And they kidnapped the uh, head of the K. Dunven and they killed him. And Italy, too, actually, uh, became quite violent. There was the Red League, and they, had, they kidnapped people and they killed people. And what common background is there? All of these countries lost. They, were lo lost, they, were, uh, they lost in World War II. I think that's a common aspect. And a German sociologist, Norbert Elias, was saying, regarding this, he did the analysis, and he said, Germany and Japan and Italy. There were students' movements that were very violent because by losing the war, people started to fear the government. That's why. Regarding this, Germany and Japan do have common aspects. But despite that, but despite that, in Germany, in 1968 already, you, you established a law regarding a state of emergency. For example, the German Red Army, regarding its actions, you could apply that law and take action. And regarding this, in Japan, we still do, cannot do that. Well, yes, um, there was a state of emergency declaration in Japan, but it was not, uh, it didn't have any forcible power to make people do things. So there are a lot of similarities, but where do these differences come from? Um, even under the state of emergency of the coronavirus, in G Germany, um, 1968, you had a law for a state of emergency. Japan still doesn't have such a law. What is your view on why there is this difference? Well, let me first say that we never really um, applied the state of emergency st um, statute. So that is something that is in the Constitution, but it has never been used. And it's quite useless because it's basically a 50s idea of how war, war works. And it's made for external conflicts, so it's basically only on the on the file, but it's never applied. I think the difference to Italy and Japan is probably with regard to Germany that the '68 generation became a legitimate government generation later, and through the Green Party, even the core of the '68 movement became total establishment. So we have been ruled, governed by 68ers. People like Joschka Fischer, foreign, for, foreign secretary in Germany, and uh, many of the Green parties and some social democrats were part of the movement. And therefore, this kind of critique of the government became governmental, which somehow helped to establish more legitimacy of the whole system. Um, the system incorporated the 68ers. And, and the 68ers run the system. And, um, and especially in the years from 1998 to 2005, the Schröder government. And therefore, I think we somehow got this into um, the whole governmental um, order and don't have to fight this as, as a problem for the legitimacy of the, of the political order. May I? Yes, Ms. Ito, please. I listened very with uh, great interest. Yes, in Japan, um, there were no government changes, and the student movements or citizens' movements 
um, people who are active n- almost never go into politics. And this is causing the government to become corrupt and also the opposition parties. Uh, they really don't have the power to constructively object what the government is doing. Um, it's very difficult to build a consensus uh, based on the op- uh, the opposition parties. And yes, people may complain um, about what the government is doing, but they are not coming up with any solutions. So forming consensus to build a society, going beyond differences in order to build a good society. How can we really do that in Japan? Well, of course, it's all about education and all about uh, the election system, but uh, maybe that's something we need to think about. And I think at the outset, you've talked about the constitutional court in Germany. And also there's the European Human Rights Court. Um, so you have these institutions. And the state of emergency law um, in Germany. Uh, yes, I have studied how uh, that law was formed, and it caused concern. I have heard the discussions, but how do you make sure that the power is not being abused? Um, I think you have a good system to prevent that from happening. You have a good system in Europe to uh, keep the power at bay. And now, if you look back at Japan, I think um, we are in a very precarious situation um, where uh, abuse of power might um, happen. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Ito. And actually, I came up with the question as I listened to you. The power of the government and the power of people, the balance between the two, which should be stronger? Or how do you balance between the two? In Germany, um, during the Cold War, uh, you had East and West Germany back then. And with the power of the government and with the, po- uh, the power of the people, power of the government was really different in the in the two Germanys. But after the two Germanys were united, the power of the company, uh, country, power of the people, um, of course, um, based on the Constitution, um, it was built, but as we see, the spread of the virus is different from country to country, but in the process of building democracy, I believe as Germany unified, uh, the people's thinking may have changed uh, regarding democracy. Can you pick up on that point? Well, I think that it's very difficult because the core problem of the unification is that there is no common perspective um, on democracy. One might say that the Western part of Germany is fairly homogenous in its experiences and has a fairly common idea of well, how democracy works. The Easterners have a different experiences and there is obviously a sharp split within the East between those who f- led some kind of decent life within Eastern Germany and those who were part of the opposition. And those who were part of the opposition try to become the avant-garde of a democratization, first of the GDR and then of whole Germany. And they basically failed with that project because what then institutionally came up was basically the old federal republic being enlarged to the whole. So, and this makes it all very messy um, because on the one hand we can say um, there are still considerable differences in the political outlook between East and West. And you can see that with regard to the success of right-wing parties, extremist parties, which are much more successful in the East. Uh, and much of this coming from different ideas of a democracy works, different ideas um, of expectations, what the state should do, a a critique of capitalism even, and and these kinds of things. Um, And then again, we have this um, Republican avant-garde within the GDR. Many of them have left the East, now live in the West, but still are somehow disappointed by the process of reunification. And on the other hand, we have a very, very low degree of sensitivity of the Westerners for the specific problems of the East. 
and we still see that the Eastern countries are basically run by Westerners. Universities in the East have presidents from the West, governments have ministers from the West, businesses have CEOs from the West. So there is still this imbalance. Um, so therefore it's very hard to, to spend, boil that down to some kind of basic conflict. But one thing that is quite interesting is that the right-wing people in the East, so very xenophobic, quite aggressive partly, have a fairly good idea of what political mobilization is. You know, they basically have seen a revolution and they somehow are empowered by that experiences and they know somehow how poli grassroots politics works. While most of the liberal democratic Westerners has no idea of that. Um, and therefore the minoritarian of the extremist issues of the Easterners are quite successful for the political process for good or for bad, because they have amazing political presence in the whole discourse, as they may even be overrepresented sometimes. Um, and that is obviously not a good news with regard to the whole system because they have very extremist views, but still shows that um, a revolutionary experience can help you to, to know how politics works in a very remarkable manner. So as a citizen, I don't necessarily like it, but as an observer, I have a certain admiration for that. Well, Professor Kayano, uh, I think uh, what we just heard is related to the question that you've raised. And I have heard from people in Geta Institute, but uh, the administrative service um, being well established in um, Germany. AFD approval rating has gone down, it seems. And I think that this is very interesting and also in the United States uh, because Donald Trump is doing a lot of strange things in the coronavirus crisis. Uh, it seems that some people are uh, distancing themselves from um, Donald Trump. Uh, we do see these things happening. So including this, so COVID-19 itself is maybe uh, anti-revolutionary, but it's causing these kinds of phenomena, phenomena, which I think is very interesting. But what do you think, Professor Kayano? <laughs> That's a difficult question. The government are made up of representatives that we have chosen. But how far can we feel that? I think it's related to that. And actually, right now, as Professor Mellos said, in Europe, the far right people, if you look at the far right, the government exists for us. The government should exist for us. They feel very strongly that way. So why, for example, regarding social security? Why do we have to pay foreigners social security? That's what they say. Or why in Brussels? Why does the EU headquarters in Brussels have to make our decisions? So that's what the far right phenomenon is saying. The government, the state, should exist for us and it belongs to us. That awareness, this time, how should I put this? Through the corona crisis, how will this change? That's something I'm watching with great interest. And regarding President Trump, so he places greater emphasis on the economy rather than containing the contagion. And it's related to maybe he's not very successful in containing the, the contagion. So therefore, in this case, the state should belong to us. So I can't really tell what the relationship is there, but how should I put this? So what changes are there in Europe? Uh, we're very much interested. So I don't have the conclusion yet, but as the 
as the issue that's being raised. People who feel strongly that the government should exist for us through the COVID-19 crisis, how are their political awarenesses changing or how is their political awareness even stronger? That's what I wanted to ask Professor Mellers. Um, yes. So, and maybe Ms. Ito, I'd like to ask you a related question regarding what Professor Kayano was saying. So, how are there changes in political awareness or human rights organizations in your global networks? I think you are very active and exchanging information. And over the past half year or so, this kind of things that never were visible before, be it negative or positive, maybe there are both. What changes have you seen over the past half year or so? Well, overall, there have been big changes. For example, China, in China, the infection moved to Europe and people are now have their hands full dealing with the infection. And regarding Hong Kong, China has managed to strengthen its control over Hong Kong. And the influence of China will probably get stronger. People are worried about this. And also, overall, in the United States, something that's very symbolic is, in the past there was discrimination, or there was suppression, or there was uh, the income gap. But through COVID-19, this is getting smaller. Problems are becoming very visible because of COVID-19. And these problems that have become visible, there are many people who feel very worried about these. And because people are staying at home, they have more time to pay attention to this. So there's more solidarity. I think there's that positive aspect. And President Trump is very hardliner. However, discrimination against blacks or against the racial minorities, these are becoming very visible. Therefore, in the United States, we're seeing large-scale demonstrations which are spreading throughout the world, which means during this time, something has changed. I can personally feel it. And this are leading to substantial changes. With COVID-19, people are staying home, they're not going out, but watching people and people coming together can lead to very emotional things before people are saying online is good but when people feel angry people coming out onto the streets coming together and gathering together the blacks and the whites coming together and protesting and raising their voices and building society by doing this i think once again we can feel that we can see that that not online but actually coming together is very moving and there are things that maybe we have to get back. And there are new stories that are globally being depicted. And I think that's a good thing. Today, actually, if things were as they should be, this was not on the agenda, but in the United States, we're seeing Black Lives Matter, those kinds of protests and movements. And related to today's topic, this is democracy. This is freedom. I think there's an overlap. And Professor Mellers and Professor Kayano, I wanted to ask you, these protests in the U.S. spreading on an unprecedented scale, how do you see this? What do you think? clear that you can somehow do something in concrete you know police violence and police racism has something got to do with the organization of the police force which is something very decentralized very much entrenched with social forces in the u.s and um, cannot be served by the federal government um and therefore i'm a little bit well i'm a bit pessimistic with regard to the um to what will come out of that My, what i think interesting and 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 Ms. Ito said that too, that the COVID crisis is somehow very helpful to to look at 
problems in different societies and to reinforce them, to reinforce tendencies that are already there. And with regard to Europe, it's interesting to see that Europe is so diverse that there's no common denominator in which direction that goes. You know, you have a country like Germany that's probably rather stabilized by COVID at the, so far. Then you have a country like Italy in which the right authoritarians were quite strong, but a little bit on the, getting a little bit weaker. And now everyone tries to sort out what does that mean for, for Italy? Um, the province government in, in Lombardia was somehow run by the right uh, wing party. So maybe that's a problem for them. But maybe the central government who was not run by Cinque Stelle was different. So no one really knows that. But then again, it can go very quickly that one kind of interpretation becomes the dominant one. And when we have one dominant interpretation of what was going on, then the political implications can be quite dramatic. And I think we are somehow waiting for what will happen in many countries. And probably we see different directions. We see a certain deterioration problem in Italy, perhaps in France, in Great Britain, less so in Spain, less in Portugal, less in Greece, less in Denmark, more in Sweden. So Europe is really quite um, diverse and the whole direction is not clear. The most important development in Europe is obviously that um, the governments of France and Germany have, have made up their mind to somehow provide a great fiscal capacity to solve the problem uh, and to, to, to provide a project that is really big with regard to money, the money flow between the member states. And this could be something that on an institutional, not on a social, on the institutional side, could really change and consolidate the European Union. That is interesting because that, there's a new consensus about reinforcing the money flow of the European Union that has not been there before. That is relatively revolutionary for the European integration. It's the first time since Helmut Kohl that the Germans are really pushing the European integration in one, in a more, in a deeper direction. That's very interesting. Professor Cayano, in the United States, there are these demonstrations. And going back to the uh, 1960s, uh, there's the civil rights movements. And maybe today we're seeing a version two of these civil rights movements. Some people are very positive about this. But Professor Cayano, how do you see these demonstrations? Well. If I remember well, under President Obama, uh, there were similar incidences. Um, Black Lives Matter. Um, I think this slogan came out during Obama era. Well, um, from the 80s, yes, it was said, but um, I think uh, it was a 17-year-old black boy that was killed by policemen. and. There was this hashtag um, in Twitter, um, I think in 2013, that it came out and it spread. Well, it's not just because it's President Trump or President Obama. I don't think that's going to change the situation. Um, as Professor Miller said, um, it is really entrenched in the American society. And no matter who is at the head of the administration, that is not going to change. And of course, it is a problem that needs to be solved, but it's not as if President Trump um, has really caused this problem to become more conspicuous. I, I, if we think in that way, that's a problem. But on the other hand, uh, the coronavirus, COVID-19, and the self-restraint that people are doing, and um, a lot of unemployment, layoffs, um, things not going very well. And that is really flaming the demonstration and protests. And this situation we are living in, uh, depending on what the leaders do, um, will change the way how this flame spreads. And maybe in that sense, uh, President Trump is not really handling the situation well. I, but I think we need 
to really look into uh, this problem. Uh, we shouldn't link this too much with the coronavirus, but uh, the reason why we see a lot of these demonstrations spreading is because of the coronavirus and is because of the way tr President Trump is handling this. Well, as I listen to all three of you, there may be different ways to assess the situation, but yes, COVID-19 could have been a trigger. Um, COVID-19 could become a game changer. And so what happens after this? Um, and when we think about physical integrity versus rights of individual freedom, how do we balance between the two? Um, under a crisis, uh, people tend to go for sh a shock doctrine, but how do we make sure that democracy uh, continues and we put a break on abuse of power by the government? I think this is something we need to talk about before the second wave and third wave of the contagion starts. Ms. Sito, uh, what is your view on how things will move forward? Well, um, before that, um, about Professor Kayano's comment. So um, about um, surveillance, how far do you want to, to um, watch people and how much of a trade-off between privacy uh, could be allowed? I think we need to resolve the situation. It, it seems that people are either for the government or uh, either against the government. Uh, we, we need to listen to diverse voices, but we are not really good at listening to these different voices. How do we, what do we do about the government? Uh, it's very difficult to talk about this. Uh, uh, we tend to form committees of, of experts and talk about it, but it's not really functioning. So it's all about participation. Uh, rather than saying uh, we are for the government or we are against the government, we need to take part in the discussion without being divided. We need to have a more inclusive politics. And transparency will be key. Um, well, in Japan, uh, the medical um, experts uh, panel, uh, it was said that they didn't have meeting minutes, and this was a very uh, big dis this was a very big issue here. But uh, there are people who have different opinion from the government's view about the coronavirus and. Uh, they have been watched uh, about what they were saying, and they are watched, but they were not able to take part in the discussion of the panel of experts. So, yes, uh, the panel of experts hold news conferences, but they didn't disclose the meeting minutes, or they didn't even keep a meeting minutes, and therefore they lack transparency. But if we can gain consensus, maybe that will change what is happening here in Japan. Now, looking globally, um, well, we are living in a global society. Uh, we may see countries that are doing well, other countries may not be not doing w very well, but we economy is all linked. We have a global economy. We can't put an end on that. We have to trade and work together with other countries. Uh, the north-south issue as well and the, the disparity between those who have and those who have not. Um, we have to work together, uh, not on by individual countries, but globally we have to work so that we can resolve the situation. Well, thank you very much. Um, I was listening to Ms. Ito and the political communication as well as disclosure of information. We have seen problems related to that in Japan, and that's probably creating the situation we see right now. Uh, I remember New York. Um, yes, they initially 
prioritized economy, then they saw the virus spread and they changed course. And uh, Governor Cuomo um, every day holds a news conference and um, he's trying to make things very transparent. We see that happening in Taiwan as well. Um, the minister will be answering question after question until the questions end. And if they made a mistake, they will admit the mistake and they say that they will resolve the situation and explain it through daily briefings. So even if there were some mistakes, uh, for example, um, Governor Cuomo is seeing his approval rate going up. But here in Japan, we were able to contain the virus. But um, yes, the prime minister may have a news conference, but he won't be speaking for an hour. Um, there is this big difference in between how the government is communicating uh, to the people, and that is leading to distrust among the people and also uh, the people's attitude. So, Professor Kayano, what is your view? Well, coronavirus, COVID-19 is a crisis, therefore risk communication is going to be very important uh, from the administration uh, towards the people in order to create confidence and trust. Concerning risk communication, well, yes, Japan is not doing very well. For example, the minister answering journalists' questions, uh, why is this impossible? I think we need to really think about that. Maybe the ministers are too busy. And they're kept busy because uh, the people may have a lot of requests for the government, and even if these requests are fulfilled, they are still unsatisfied. So I think we need to have a more streamlined way of handling administration because it seems that the burden is borne by the few who are trying to keep the administration functioning. Uh, yes, in front of you, you have this politician that you may hate. You tend to criticize that person, but you don't see what's happening behind that person. And that is not really good. Uh, we may be fighting for freedom, but those fighters are actually taking away the people's freedom. And I think we are seeing that happen under COVID-19. So these are the changes in values through COVID-19, and I'd like to make a proposition. The issue of privacy, that's one problem. To make to streamline administration in Japan, you need to have a personal ID number to open a bank account, for example. Or you should link credit cards to bank accounts. That's what people want to do. But if you do that, then that means that privacy information are going to be uh, attached to your personal ID number and we may lose our privacy. People are worried about this. But personally, regarding people who say that, I feel that you need to look at things in more detail. In other words, by having personal ID numbers, what are the privacy rights that are going to be infringed? In other words, your bank information or your health insurance. Some people want to link health insurance to uh, personal ID numbers. So your health insurance or your medical information. This kind of information. Either way, if the government wants to get it, it can. It just takes time. So going to the bank and getting a warrant from the courts. Getting a warrant from the courts is important. It's important. But be it personal ID numbers to access information, all you have to do is have a system in place where you have to get a warrant from the courts. So by streamlining administration, I don't think everyone says privacy is going to be infringed, but I don't really understand which privacy, which part of privacy is going to be infringed because 
the government has the ability to check all of the information, but can they do that in an easy way or not? That's the only difference. So people in the field are very busy. When you think about that, it's better to streamline. And on the other hand, which information? There's going to be a log of which information the authorities accessed. So we need to make the system transparent so we can access what they looked at and ask for explanations. If we do it that way, then we can control our information. In that respect, privacy versus streamlining administration. We need to have a new issue definition. Of course, I am against uh, having um, inf past history of what your behavior, because that's privacy. So regarding that, I think what South Korea is doing is uh, I'm against what South Korea is doing. However, in the past, there's information that the government was able to get in a fragmented way. But streamlining this and bringing this together is that's information that they could get anyway. So I don't know how that is an infringement on privacy. At the risk of being repetitive, the police, for example, will access your information and there'll be a log as to what information the police accessed. So we need to make sure that that information can be accessed. I think that's a better way of doing it and we can protect ourselves from unneeded infringements of our privacy. When the police checks on us, we don't know what they checked. As Ito-san said, she said participation is important. But by utilizing technology means that this will lower the obstacles to participation. You can control your own information and your own privacy. Therefore, I feel that we need to redefine the problem. Professor Mellus, listening to Professor Kayano, I wanted to ask you, Professor Mellus, regarding what Professor Kayano was saying, he's talking about privacy. He's talking about administrative services and to enjoy those services. We have the right to enjoy those services. We have the right to decide privacy for ourselves. At the same time, we have to think about how we handle risk, in what way, regarding the uncertain future, regarding the uncertain risks. How do we face this uncertainty? In the case of Japan, we tend to ask for zero risk. And that's why administration is so inefficient. But including all of this, regarding how we handle privacy, how we handle risks, could you please let us know what you think? Well, I think I would agree with what um, Pusen Yakanyo has said before. It's important to see that our own expectations are somehow contradictory. Um, people don't want to get sick, people want to get protected, and people want, at the same time, respect for their privacy. And I also think that the only way to, to solve that problem somehow is to find procedures um, in which we can somehow live up to certain standards but not really shield the state totally from any information. I think it's quite clear um, that the public health system needs information about even people's state of health, um, especially in an epidemic crisis. And, um, and therefore, as in other cases, um, we, need the, we need to differentiate out what the state is doing. We need con judicial review. We need administrative controls. We need transparency and many other things, um, which is more effective and more living up to our contradictory preferences um, than to s build some kind of wall around, you know, individuals or, or around the administration, perhaps. Um, I even think that if you build up these walls, um, what you will get is actually much more of an informal breach in which somehow, you know, information is organized um, around the rules um, um, for social and public pressure um, so that the whole system becomes more difficult to be governed on the one hand and more intransparent on the other hand. Um, the important thing is that you have somehow plurality of actors so that not everything is tied to the governmental interests, but that you have some people that are somehow independent in, in their review, that you have um, a plurality of interests within the administration, 
that you have calls that are not totally dependent um, in their appointment and in their um, careers by the government um, and so on and so forth. So basically what you have to do is you have to pluralize public administration. And if you can do that, um, you can trust it with information and you can make it possible to um, find procedures in which you know, also public health issues are somehow taken care of by the state. Ms. Ito, I wanted to ask you. Professor Kayano talked about the police, or he talked about COVID-19 countermeasures. And in that respect, there are experts in infections or sanitation, and it's okay to access. Some people say it's okay to access your information, but we need to make sure that you can see logs of what information they accessed. And Professor Mellis was saying that you need to have procedures and you need to have transparency. And from the perspective of human rights, Ms. Ito, maybe you have a different perspective. What do you think? Let me see. Privacy. I do not think privacy alone is important. And we have to think about streamlining as well. But there are other things that are important as well. First, how should I put this? Under a crisis like this, people should not use the crisis as an excuse. Or, and, and they should not let go of their privacy. I have a feeling that maybe the people are being forced to do so because of this COVID-19 crisis, give up on their privacy, and depending on the government, depending on the state. Some people feel security when they feel that they are being uh, controlled or surveyed by the government, and I feel that's risky. If it's a strong civic society, or if the judi judicial arm, how does it function? The people, each individual and the state have a relationship and being controlled by the state. This could turn into a risky model regarding judicial processes, regarding fairness. Can we solve this issue? We need to try to maintain a good balance. And also, a physical integrity is important. We need to protect the lives of people. And we also need to think about the relationship with freedom. This is not something that started recently. So this is th something we've had for a long time. But now we are facing this question once again under COVID-19. In Europe also, probably freedom has gone down a little bit. Maybe people let go of their freedom to a certain extent because of this crisis. A life, of course, is very important. Uh, we want to protect lives. And we still have this very vague sense of fear, and we want to protect ourselves from this fear. And therefore, we see this balance uh, being tipped to a certain extent. But we need to handle this problem all at the same time. Well, thank you very much. Uh, people who are watching this program live um, are sending in their questions through, our, through the chat function. So uh, let's take up some of those questions now. So based on what Ms. Ito said, I believe this is really linked to what you've just said, but um, freedom or protection of lives, if we have to select either one, uh, we don't have to select either one, and we shouldn't force people to select either one. Life and also uh, freedom have to strengthen each other. Um, 
Can I ask first uh, Professor Kayano? Or were you asking that question to Ms. Ito? Can I answer that? Okay, then uh, Professor Kayano and then Professor Millers. Okay, you start and then I'll go to Dr. Uh, Professor Millers after that. Well, then, thank you. The questioner, uh, I think I understand how this person feels. Yes, uh, we don't want to be forced to select either one. Um, that is the uh, that's best, uh, not being not having to select either one. And I totally agree, but there are cases where we will have to select either one. Uh, for example, under a crisis like this, and maybe the, the infection spreads um, to, to an uncontrollable uh, situation. So then, which one will you choose then? Uh, looking back at human history, I think we already have the answer. Protection of life, protection of people's existence, is prioritized uh, because if we all die, there is no freedom to speak of. Uh, we have stay, uh, faced starvation, infectious diseases, natural disasters. We have always been facing crisis. So f this sense of freedom, this concept of freedom, only came up after uh, we became more wealthier and affluent. Maybe in the far past, um, when philosophy started to develop. Uh, it's only in the 19th century that freedom became a main theme, and that is because we were not really affluent until then. So nobody was thinking about freedom. We couldn't afford to think about freedom. People had to live in groups, and in order to live in groups, that had been the priority. Uh, how do you divide uh, the the food among the group, or how do you produce goods among the groups? Um, we had to think about that in order to survive. So that's a given. Um, that's the way we have lived in the past. So is it life or freedom? If we have to select either one, we have to select life in that situation. And so what we can do is to make sure that we are not faced with that selection. We need to make sure that we don't create a situation where we have to select either one. And then we will be able to uphold freedom. We need to have conditions for freedom. And that's what I would like to emphasize. Thank you very much. Um, Professor Mellers, please. Yes, uh, on the one hand, I would agree with what Professor Katana says, um, that in a way, life is the basis for freedom. But on the other hand, you can see that people in our generation and the younger generation have become much more um, keen on, you know, a general concept of welfare and survival. Well, we can see that, you know, in earlier pandemic situations, generations that were perhaps um, used to f experiences like war um, had a much um, more lenient approach to, you know, the fact that many people are dying. So we had huge pandemics in the 50s and 60s in Germany, where flu pandemics where 50,000 50, people were dying in a year. And you can see when you look at the interviews that were there in 1967 or so, or the 1950s, people were quite undramatic and somehow they were used to the experience of general death and a general threat much more than we are today. And I think this is a progress, you know, you shouldn't be used to war, you shouldn't be, you more, you shouldn't be used to mass death and, 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 and a lethal threat that is somewhere around all, all over. But still, I think there's nothing historically necessary about um, our big effort to protect every life. 
it's in a way also a product of a civilization. And it's also something that it might be fragile. And we may also come back to a state of civilization in which the interest in the protection of every single life is not as keen and as not as big as it is today. So this might change too. So also not only our take on liberty, but also our approach to life is somehow historically variant and, and, and may, may, may become different when the crises are becoming bigger. Thank you very much. There is a, another question coming in. Uh, the new coronavirus. Uh, after it is contained, I believe we will see more movements in politics. Well, COVID-19, once we see this situation being settled, maybe we will go back to pre COVID-19 or the post COVID-19 is not going to be exactly like pre-COVID. Uh, maybe we will see a new situation. Is that positive or negative? Um, let's start with Ms. Ito. If we are going back to pre-COVID days, um, I think it's a waste. I think we should build back better. Not going back, but we should restructure society based on our experience. For example, in economy, global economy, um, it was based on the exploitation of cheap labor in the developing countries. And the rich countries became richer because of that. But once the factories in the developing countries were closed, we now understand that the economy cannot survive. So sustainability of the economy, um, sustainability is a key word of the UN, but this is something we need, need to really think about. Um, we see this disparity of between the haves and have-nots. Um, we need to resolve that situation and we need to have international solidarity. And um, COVID-19 also is connected to uh, biodiversity or climate change. It's not just a slogan. Uh, we need to face these issues or else the earth itself, the planet itself is not sustainable and economy will not be sustainable. Uh, because of COVID-19, the burden on the environment has gone down a little bit and things are changing and we ho I hope that this change will continue. And is it life or is it rights? If you look at mankind, power has always been fighting infections to try to have people live longer. There's that aspect. And there are those that have been left behind, people with disabilities, women, people who are discriminated against. When certain people survive, that means you create people who are advantaged, and then there are people who are left out. And if the state concentrates on narrowing it down, then some people will be left out. So we need to think more about the people who are getting left out. And I think this is a good opportunity for doing so. And I hope that even after COVID-19, we can continue to think about this. Professor Kayano, Regarding what we just heard, after corona, wh what about globalization? We'll probably have to change. At the same time, regarding infection countermeasures like this, we need to have global, international cooperation. So what about political moves after COVID-19? Earlier on, we talked about how the government should belong to us. That awareness through COVID-19, how will that awareness change? 
That was the proposition that I made. And one thing that I expect, or one direction that I think is possible is, and that is, if you had to say, the government belongs to us, that awareness, I think that will spread further among the people. And as a result of this, people, the political forces that were declaring this before, they will lose the support that they used to have. I think that's the phenomenon we're going to see. In other words, for example, in France, there's the People's Front, there's a political party. And for the first time in a presidential election, they were able to go to the finals. And, and Ms. Le Pen's father went to the finals in the election and and won a little under 20% of the votes. But today, in the former presidential election, the daughter was a candidate. And out of the three candidates, one person uh, voted for from National. Front National. And the reason is, what the Front National was saying, they are softer and be easier to accept for the people. And this time, thanks to COVID-19, on this earth, today, to, to prevent the spread of the infection, you can stop airplanes from flying, or you can prohibit people from leaving home. In Japan, it wasn't a prohibition, but, either, but in Europe, uh, I think you can keep people at home. And before, it was only the government that can do this. I think that's something that people have now discovered. Today, on the earth, legally, the only organization, the only body that can force this on people are governments. So the WHO may be stronger, but the WHO has no power to enforce. It has no authority. Therefore, to protect ourselves, in the end, the only organization that we can rely on is the government. And people are now more widely aware of this, which means that the organizations or the parties that were declaring this are now going to lose their support. So there may be that kind of contrarian phenomenon that may occur in the future. And in that respect, actually, the EU right now is facing a big challenge. It's under great challenge. This time with the COVID-19 crisis, I think it's the EU that has lost a lot of its authority. What could the EU have done regarding COVID-19? It was only the member states that people could rely on. It was only the member states, the governments, that could restrict the movement of people, or it was only the member states that could engage in fiscal countermeasures and listening to the EU and reducing the fiscal output would have led to dire results. That's what the people of it Italy are thinking. So people are now returning to the state governments or the member state governments. That's another direction that may occur. And maybe that will not happen. We don't know yet. But I feel that the EU, this time, is now facing a big challenge because of COVID-19. And I'd be interested in what Professor Mellers thinks. Uh, yes, regarding what Professor Kayano said, I think he was trying to ask you, Professor Mellers, what do you think? Well, you know, the question is always, what are you talking about when you talk about the EU? Because basically the EU is the creation of the member states. And therefore, the weakness of the EU is also the creation of the member states. And what we have seen in the last 20 years is that the member states have become more powerful within the EU. And the EU organs, the Commission above all, has become less relevant. So the disappointment about the EU is in a way something that is, should be a disappointment about the member states that are unable to converge around building up a um, stable and robust organization within the EU. 
And I think what we now see is actually finally that member state governments have understood this, especially the German one, and, and that no one is really well served when the member states somehow have this parasitical um, um, relationship to the EU, that they somehow always nationalize the successes of the EU and unionize the failures of the member states. So we'll see. But something really big has happened in the last weeks. Um, um, there might be a major institutional change with regard to the EU. And therefore, we might end up with stronger EU even, even now. And I think um, from the perspective of many members, especially smaller member states, that's a very good development. Right. I think we are running out of time. We're actually past the scheduled time. So I think we had a very good discussion today from a lot of different perspectives. And lastly, maybe, we could have a few words from each of our members, what you wanted to say today but you didn't, regarding freedom and regarding protecting the people. How should we think about this in the future? Could we have a comment from each of you and then we'll close the proceedings? So, Professor Kayano, could you start, please? Today, there's an issue I did not touch on. There's another thing about freedom that I did not touch on that I'd like to point out. We cannot leave home and we feel that's a restriction of our freedom. Many people feel that way. And that was the prerequisite, the basic premise of our discussions today. However, on the other hand, and in Japan, there's the Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare that declared this in April. People were asked to stay home and people actually stayed home in April. The number of suicides in Japan compared to last year was down by 20%. And over the past five years, if you go back five years, this is the smallest number of suicides that Japan has had. So this shows you how going to work or being bullied at school or going to work and having difficult human relationships, working for what's called a black company and suffering from harassment, people like that. You can tell. You can discern how many people are suffering like that before staying at home. In other words, staying at home may actually be a form of freedom. And I'm actually not really able to uh, quantify this, but in the past, the freedom of not being able to go out, or actually the inconvenience of not being able to go out, is that really a restriction on our freedom? I think that's not thinking about freedom enough. So in that sense, as we go back to normal life, maybe we will see the number of suicides rise again. Um, this is something we need to watch, uh, make sure that we have measures in place so that we can change people's minds if they are thinking about suicide. Well, thank you very much. Um, yes, on um, the April number of suicides, yes, I heard that and I have asked some experts, but um, after the Great East Japan earthquake and also um, this crisis with COVID-19, when something really big in society happens, it, it seems that the number of suicides go down. Um, actually, after the great earthquake, um, the elderly people's mortality rate went down and also suicides uh, went down. But of course, um, over the, a longer term, if we look at the longer term, maybe the number of suicides will rise. But as you just said, uh, people not going to work, uh, people working online, uh, maybe that reduced the stress of workers. Um, it, it does seem that it's a trend. We see that on Twitter. So maybe it is time for us to rethink the way we work. Well, thank you very much. Then going to Professor Mellers, um, any last one final message to all the viewers? Well, 
first of all, I have to really hurry up because I have to pick up my children. So I will be very short. <laughs> uh, um, I think it's very interesting to see how the idea of liberty and um, and the way the coronavirus addresses liberties is so culturally different in in different um, um, in different states and even industrialized nations like Japan and Germany and even you know countries like Germany and Italy or so somehow conceive very differently of what really is a concern of freedom for them and um, and living outside leaving your apartment or being or going to work has so different cultural meanings and the practices are so different that the political problems that rise with the COVID crisis will probably spell out differently too. And, and this is fascinating. I think we just don't know too much. We use the same concept and the same words for um, cultures that are so vastly diverge and diverse that we somehow um, really have to work a lot on, on cultural translation to understand where the real problem lies. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, if you need to <laughs> pick up your children, yes, <laughs> you can leave. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much. And now then, uh, lastly, Ms. Ito, please. And thank you to uh, Professor Mullers. Well, uh, the last part of the discussion. Yes, I totally agree with what he said. Um, well, not needing to commute means that I have two or three more free time. Uh, so the way we look at freedom, it seems as if freedom was forced upon us, even if we have accepted that. That may have been the situation among Japanese citizens. But with COVID-19, uh, we probably reviewed um, the way we live, the quality of life. And that may have led to changes. So maybe it is time that we think about a new concept of freedom, which may change the quality of life, the meaning of life for all of us. Yes, um, there are people who are living in hardship. Uh, maybe they lost their homes, and we as a society will have to think of how to support them at the same time. Thank you very much. Um, two full hours of discussion on freedom as well as freedom under COVID-19. Uh, yes, we have been able to touch upon many different aspects and it was a very interesting discussion. And as Professor Mellers said at the very end, when we say freedom, we tend to think that we are talking about the same thing but it may have different meanings, different values among countries and even among different individuals. The word and concept of freedom. Uh, I, I believe the difference has become very clear because of COVID-19. Um, there may be common concepts of freedom and different concepts of freedom, but we need to differentiate between these things, and we might have to say that this part of freedom is important, but this part may not be. This is different from you, but this is the same as you. Uh, we need to be able to understand that and be ready to accept the difference. But thank you very much for staying with us until the very end. Uh, Studio 202X next week, um, same time, um, we will be having another discussion. The theme may change, but um, we will give the notice on the web page of Goethe Institute. So we hope that you can join us once again next week. And 
uh, today's discussion will be archived. You will be able to see it once again if you wish to. So, uh, Professor Kayano, Ms. Ito, and Professor Millers, thank you very much for staying with us until a very late time. Thank you, and I hope that we can gather again for another discussion sometime soon. So with this, uh, Studio 202X, um, this is the end of the program. I hope to see you again next week.